congrats on this new film. My first question for you today is, how would you describe it to someone that might be a new fan? Well, uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, it's a time travel movie that only allows you to go back less than a minute in time. You can't get all the way back to your birthday. Uh, that deals with science fiction in a way that asks how much power can you have before you become an asshole? I think that's the way to do it. <laughs> Was this your first experience working or directing Morgan Freeman? Yeah, this was uh, quite a treat for me getting to work with uh, Mr. Freeman. He um, uh, liked uh, the version of the script that we sent him, but he wanted uh, some real science in there. He was like, there has to be some kind of real science to springboard off of to uh, create this time travel element. And so that was actually one of the more difficult parts of the screenwriting process was um, we had to actually talk to some scientists and physicists and, and try and figure out what we could find that would create uh, something something within reality to kind of spring forth to uh, this time travel element. Um, yeah. But other than that, he was just really great to work with. I mean, on set, he's just the consummate professional. It's uh, it was it was very easy, very easy to work with, knows his stuff and and gives 100 percent. So how did you hunt down scientists to work with? What was that process like? Oh, that was just asking people that I knew if they knew a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And actually, we got really lucky that um, one uh, one of the a, pro, a, a friend of one of the producers had a brother who was actually a physicist or an astrophysicist or something like that. So once we connected with that person, it became a lot easier. But it's like I'm like, I don't. Who do I know? <laughs> so, yeah, it was just kind of throwing it out there and seeing what came back for a minute before we, you know, started calling up Harvard and MIT and places like that. How did you first encounter the novel Lucifer that this was adapted from? You know, I hadn't heard of it uh, until this project. And um, one of the um, uh, exec producers on the project, Thomas Vitale, had read this when he was in, I guess, high school or someplace and had wanted to do something with this story for years and years. And Thomas used to uh, be over at the Sci-Fi Channel. So, you know, he he's really steeped in in that world. And he had this, uh, this short story. And when I read it, I was like, oh, my gosh, I, I can't believe it. I hadn't seen this. I wasn't familiar with the author. Um, but, you know, my my sci fi knowledge, I guess, isn't all that vast or doesn't go back that far. Um, but, you know, the story was so interesting and it's such a quick, dark journey down a rabbit hole with this. I don't know if you've read it. It looks like you have, but I haven't. Uh, no, uh, but it's it's about this guy who who finds a ring. He's his character is much darker than Franklin's is in the film that we have. He has no redeeming qualities he's a jerk that finds a a cool toy and he uses it as you might imagine a jerk would yeah. um now we have some of those things in the film uh the trick for us was taking that and then kind of adjusting the character to make it someone that you you actually rooted for because no one was going to root for this other guy over here other than we want you dead um but, but some of the things that were in the short story have, you know, made their way into the film. Probably uh, the biggest being the uh, airplane sequence at the end. It wasn't on a private jet. It was on a big commercial jet. And, you know, this guy uh, that's in the short story is on there and he's been accosting uh, a stewardess who doesn't know it because he's going back 57 seconds whenever he kind of gropes her. And then this thing happens where the plane uh, is is going down and he can't get back far enough to get anyone to believe him and or save himself. So 
that that was the big thing uh other than the the ring and the idea of going back only 57 seconds that came from the short story you're very well known to horror fans for the tales from the hood films how often do fans approach you about those films how often does that sort of come up in your life um you know i guess probably more than i would have thought when we made the movie years ago uh God, I, I don't like to think how long ago it was. It only reminds me of how old I am. But, um, you know, you, you make things in a. You make things in a bubble of the period and the time that you're in, and you're just focused on everything about it at that moment. And to be years down the road and have, you know, I, I've done so many talks at different schools about it. A few places have kind of taught it in you know a small way as part of a curriculum not the whole curriculum um and to have so many i think one of the reasons why especially in the 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 first tales the one that everyone really loves uh, the the stories sadly somehow all seem to be still pertinent it, it, it's like we're living so much of these uh these things over and over again so in one way, it's, you know, it's gratifying that uh, people still have a connection to it and new people find it. Uh, and then at the other, on the other hand, it's, you know, it's kind of frustrating that you're still dealing with the same ills in society. But it, I guess, in a sense, that makes, that's understandable because, you know, the whole idea behind Tales Anyhow was that, you know, we are the monsters Hum humanity we're our own monster there's you know the the paranormal is is not really what we have to be afraid of we really have to be afraid of the people walking up and down the street that's mm -hmm. who's going to come and get us um and so the idea that you know people are people from hundreds and hundreds of years ago to today you know we've still haven't grown out of some of the of what we are which is basically uh at some level killing machines <laughs> yeah and maybe in some ways it's gotten better but in some ways it's maybe gotten worse how has um audience response to the film changed over the last you know 30 years well that's really interesting because um you know, I would say when we first came out, for instance, uh, when the film first opened, um, th there was there's there was a commonality of opinion amongst groups as it related to some of the stories uh, because it's anthology within tales, mm -hmm. and then there was a, a divergent um, opinion about some of the stories. So. The story about the rogue cops that uh, was the one that opens opens up the film. Um, I I had a lot of white audiences at the time that really did not like like that story, but they they really liked um, the story at the end, which was uh, uh, Lamont Bentley's uh, uh, gang character and Rosalind Cash, who's trying to save him. In that that was kind of uh, the black on black crime story. The front part was the blue on black crime story um today there are you know young members of the african-american community that i talk to that don't particularly like the gang story because they feel uh they feel like um mm. i'm being uh, I'm, I'm not understanding crazy k enough because he's he's had all these problems heaped a problem uh heaped upon him I don't agree with that, but that the and and I wouldn't say that that is a large majority, but there is that sentiment that wasn't there when we made the movie. On the other hand, uh, a lot more of uh, the white audience now really appreciates the cop story. Um, so you know, I guess as with all things in society, uh, because the the film is dealing with ills that we have every day, it's kind of a fluid understanding that people that uh, is formed by the audience that kind of changes as 
as we change, as as we learn about ourselves and and uh, have different approaches to the things that we're dealing with on a day to day. It's definitely one of my favorite horror films, and I've been really fascinated with the journey you were on to get the follow up titles made. And I think you've been on record saying that uh, the success of Get Out helped with you know, interest in, in getting it funded. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, we um, we had a chance to get a sequel uh, made maybe just a year or so after the first one. Uh, and then, you know, as often happens, uh, 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 studio heads changed and on and on. And we could just, we could never get it off the ground. Um, which is kind of too bad because that one we would have had um, at least the budget, if not more than we had for the first one. And uh, from talking to people like that budget today, which was uh, over a little over six million, then would probably be somewhere between 18 and 20 today. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, so we, we didn't get it made and um, get out comes along and does, you know, amazingly well. <laughs> and uh, uh, really reignites interest in uh, horror and, you know, also in African-American horror. So, you know, you've seen a lot of things come out since then because of that. But that is what allowed us to get another shot at uh, Tales from the Hood. The, the difficult part of it was that the amount of money that we had to do that you know, these these last two iterations are less than the amount of money that we had for the first one. So the first one was six million dollars, maybe 18 to 20 in today's money. And for these, we got three million, you know, a little over three in today's money, somewhere around five in today's money, which, you know, created a lot of uh, meant we had to leave out some stories that we would have rather had in the anthology than uh, the, the follow-ups than the ones that we had. Um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it was quite, <laughs> it was quite a journey. Thanks to get out. We at least got to do something and, and kind of bring it back, but um, not having the resources to do what we probably would have liked to do uh, did sting. Are you able to share any details on some of the stories that didn't make the cut due to budget? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, yes, there's there's stories that didn't make the cut due to budget, stories that didn't make the cut due to politics, quite frankly. Oh. Um, and, you know, which is kind of understandable because Tales is a, a film that really deals with the political and social uh, worlds to to some people's delight and to some people's hatred. There are a lot of horror fans, as I'm sure you know, that mm -hmm. do not like politics included in their horror whatsoever. So that given. But um, yeah, there, there's uh, an example of a story, a couple of stories that, you know, we would have liked to have done. There was one that was set um, at a university and kind of dealt with a little bit of the Dylan Roof story. That was the kid that came in. Yeah, shot up all the people in the uh, church. What was that five or six years ago now? I can't remember. But um, that story, everyone liked it. And we kept trying to shoehorn it in. But because it was taking place on this university campus, the number of students that we had, uh, in the, there were some party scenes, some fraternity scenes, and so on and so forth. We just couldn't figure out a way to do it. Plus, we were shooting, um, we were shooting in Canada on the second one. The first one we were in Louisiana. Uh, in Louisiana, the budget was so low that it was a non-starter to begin with. Uh, when we went to Canada, we thought we might be able to stretch it. It was still tight, and on top of that, we were shooting in Canada. Uh, and I think we shot that in, um, uh, where did we shoot that? Uh, it'll come to me in a second, but we would not have been able to get the extras that we needed. I mean, we obviously needed some white extras, but we needed a lot of black extras that sounded like they were from the United States. Uh, and that just didn't present itself yeah. too well up there. 
And then uh, in the second one, the one where we had um, Keith David uh, as our, our Mr. Sims, um, I, we shot a whole wraparound, um, you know, so the interstitial that kind of, you know, holds all the stories together in the anthology, we shot an entire wraparound with Keith and, you know, some of the other actors. And we, uh, I think we shot, that was one of the first things I shot when I got down to Louisiana and we, you know, put an assembly edit together real quick and the studio gets it and says, we're, we're not going to release this. You have to rewrite it and reshoot. And we're all like, why? It's like, well, you're, it's obvious you're making uh, too many allusions to Trump and we don't want, we don't, you know, they were worried about us taking the piss out of Trump. Uh, I just worked with an Australian direct uh, uh, DP. So I'm using Australian terminology for some reason, but I, then I had to rewrite that story and what we shot in, I think about two and a half to three days, I had one day to reshoot. Wow. And so that, wraparound which now is all taking place pretty much in one room until we get to the end is uh every time i see it i just kind of ugh. um and you know these are the these are the, the 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 traumas and the things that you go through you know i making definitely making indie low budget films i talk to people who work on big films and they go well, it's all the same it's just bigger money i'm like yeah but at least it's bigger money yeah <laughs> i i have heard rumors about there being a series at points in development was there any truth to that and can you speak to you know what was going on there yeah yeah we uh were close um we were close on a deal that would have put it uh, with NBC Universal um, uh, as a, you know, we had gotten a pilot deal to to write it, not to shoot it, but we had a pilot deal to write the, the scripts for it. Um, and like I said, we, we have stacks of stories to, to kind of choose from. Um, and it was the classic thing. The, the head changed before um spike steel could be done because spike is still our executive producer on these and when the heads changed the the person that came in is like no we don't want to do it oh <laughs> it's literally um you know literally a choice that the 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 new uh person in charge over there decided now is that mean you know you're at the end of that development or is there any hope for the future of a series we are always looking for some way to do more with uh uh tales and we'd love to you know get a series and, and every now and then it comes back up so um i, I can't say that that's that's the end because we're always pushing but uh it's it's uh it's been a it's been a weird struggle to be honest i mean and and the tricky part is you know making the deals we have to make spike's deal our deal and uh all of that but fingers crossed that uh you know we we could do something you know when i worked on creep show with um uh, a couple of years back with greg nicotero it just made me want to do it all the more uh because that was so much fun but uh, anyhow yeah, because Creepshow is a great example of sort of the tone and direction that this could take. And you have a lot of experience in the world of TV. I'm very curious, what is Dave Chappelle like to work with? Oh, man, Dave is a, he's you show up to work uh, and you just don't know what you're going to see. And you, but you know, it's going to be fun and it's going to be good. That's that's what working with Dave is. Yeah, uh, he was one of the. You know, I, I, I had to have, I always had to have a camera on Dave when, when, when I was working with him. So when we would shoot, even if I was doing someone else's coverage, I still kept a camera on Dave because you just never knew what he was going to say. And it was like, you're, you're always trying to catch lightning in a bottle with him. Mm -hmm. Um, because you, you can ask him to do it again and he's not a jerk. He won't go, I can't do that again, but it'll still be slightly different so 
uh because he's always you know his his comedic juices are uh always flowing and when he kind of goes down into the the characters that he was doing and, and it was interesting because i would talk to him from time to time and he'd go yeah no i haven't figured this character out yet so he really put a lot of thought into what looks like sometimes just lunacy and craziness but for him he had his process where he would figure out what this character was about and where it was going and he, and he was he was um pretty sharp about how he wanted to do those things um i'm also a big wanda sykes fan i'm curious you know what is that set like wanda is <laughs> you know what she is like warmer than you would probably think that's that's the best way i could say it i mean yeah. because you see her you know her her comedic persona you know very very smart quick sharp cutting uh the way her comedy is but you know she she's also a genuinely good warm person uh so i think that's probably what i kind of took away from the experience of working with her and i've worked with her a couple of times now and and i'm always like i'm like oh yeah she's really actually kind of nice she's mm -hmm. you know she's a she, sweet may be the wrong way to say it but she's 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 definitely got a, a warm side to her that you don't get in uh her comedy um you've clearly worked with tons of icons would you say morgan freeman in 57 seconds was that sort of one of the like most prestige of the field that you've got to develop with uh yeah working with morgan and josh and, and the entire cast but definitely the the two of them on 57 seconds was you know uh for me kind of stepping into a a different uh a different space with the type of actor that i was working with um you know they are so keyed in to who, what their characters are, their motivations, that the conversations that you have with them are are, you know, you're not you're not directing in the same way. You're kind of watching where it goes, and, and then maybe you're just doing a little oh, a little nudge, a little guide this way or that, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to you know having to you know kind of get into the trenches and and help someone understand what their character is doing so you know working with them and finding out that i you know we had them in the movie you know the initial thing is oh my god uh, this is uh, let me i'm gonna really have to have my myself together for yeah. this um but at the same time it it allows you to to kind of focus on things in a different way because they bring so much to the table yeah. um the scene in the plane uh towards the end where the, the plane is going down and franklin is kind of accepting this and you just see all the stuff play on his face um i was like well do you want me to talk you through he said no no i got it and i just put the camera on him and let it sit and he just he just brought it whatever was happening up in here was happening there but you can read it all on his face um and to me it's like one of my favorite little scenes in the film it, you know there's no effects or anything but it's just this guy really giving it giving you everything and 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 you know without words it's uh really really cool to see and watch an actor that that can bring it like that I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that fans can watch 57 Seconds um, via like VOD and rental. Do we know anything about the future of how fans can access this film and streaming, or is that all sort of locked up right now? Yeah, I'm. I'm I wish I could tell you that I knew more about it other than the Apple of it all, but uh, yeah. um, I'm assuming at some point you you know it'll end up on a DVD on Amazon or something like that. But that's an assumption by me. So. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much and congrats on the exciting new film. It was really awesome chatting with you today. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it.